We'll be on our good behavior. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, please okay. uh, welcome Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Thanks. Let's do a sound check. If you cannot hear me okay, please raise your hand. <laughs> Are you okay? Okay. Well, today I have a new topic that I delved into only a few weeks ago for the first time, and then I got on the Internet with my access to the Iowa City newspaper archives, which is really nice, and it's not expensive for someone who uses a lot. It's like 6 or $7 a month. And I can go back to basically 1890 is all. I say is all because I'd love to go back before that with this, and maybe there is a way to do that online without, uh, well, I suppose you could get that from Peng's. I'm trying to think of the outfit that does all the genealogy. Anyway, it's been really great. And so I've done a lot of the work that way, and I decided I'd look into the 10 block of South Clinton Street in Iowa City, and I'll tell you what that means in a moment. But the history of the structures and the notable businesses that existed on the block since the founding of Iowa City, Iowa City will be explored. When we look at the, the image here on the upper left, that's probably from the early 1870s. And the view on the lower right is trying to get the, kind of the same perspective. And that's right now, 150 years later. Much has changed, yet quite a bit is still recognizable. When much of the downtown of Iowa City gave way to urban renewal, or as my friend Rich Green laments, urban removal, the block of Clinton Street south of Iowa Avenue was untouched. And that was one of very few such blocks. So I'll take you through the history of the buildings as I know them, or know it, ranging from the St. James Hotel, that's the one, to Whetstone Drug, Coast and Coast Men's Clothing Store, to Rees Iowa Bookstore, and many more names, some familiar, some not. So what do I mean by a 10 block? Why the designation 10 South Clinton Street? Let's start with how Iowa City was laid out in 1839, the year of its creation. On this map, which shows the original plat of Iowa City, we see that there were 100 blocks. They were all numbered. Most of these blocks were laid out to be 320 feet by 320 feet. Most of the streets were 80 feet wide. Davenport and Gilbert, for example. Five of the six streets that were associated with the Capitol Square, as they called it, were each made 100 feet wide, Clinton Street being one of them. Only one street was 120 feet wide, and that was Iowa Avenue, which was planned to be the symbolic avenue in town running between Capitol Square and Governor's Square to the east. Governor's Square was never developed, in case you're wondering why that is so wide on Iowa Avenue. The block that we are concerned with is block number 80, I've circled in red. Clinton Street runs along the west side of block 80, north and south, in front of Capitol Square. We can observe from the map that most blocks were platted with alleys. Block 80 was one of a few that was not platted with an alley. However, today there is an access for vehicles to drive into the center portion of the block, and that's a passageway between the St. Birch Tavern, which is a relatively new name there, and the and Basta Restaurant. Also, we notice that each block was platted with eight lots, with each lot 80 feet wide by 150 feet deep. Now I'll explain what a 10 block is. In Iowa City street numbering, starts at the center of Capitol Square, of course now known as the Pentecrest. If a north-south line and an east-west line were drawn through the center, we can visualize the numbering system. The first blocks to the east and west of Capitol Street are called 10 blocks, and that means they may have street numbers that range from 1 to 99. The same applies to the first blocks to the north and south of Iowa Avenue. The second blocks are called 100 blocks, with numbering that may range between 100 and 199, and so forth. And so the block on Clinton Street between Iowa Avenue and Washington Street is a 10 block. And since it is south 
of the east-west line from which numbering begins, we'll call it the 10 block of South Clinton Street. A rather long explanation of how we number in Iowa City. I have more, though, if you want to know. This is an image of the 10 South Clinton Street block made by Isaac Weatherby, perhaps a name at least familiar to you from, from reading a little bit. He was a portrait painter from out east, an early Iowa City photographer who came here in 1854. He recorded the first daguerreotype image or daguerreotype image of the old Capitol in 1854 and created many other early pictures. This is one of the oldest recorded images of Iowa City. It's been dated to 1854, but the late Bob Hibbs believed it to be from 1856 for some reason. And we think one of the buildings shown in this image still exists, and I'll discuss that later. Many of the wooden structures seen here were replaced with buildings with more fire-resistant brick exterior walls. Iowa City's first brick maker was Sylvanus Johnson who moved to Iowa in 1837. His first bricks were made in 1840, we think, as he provided the bricks for many of Iowa City's oldest buildings, including the interior walls of the old Capitol. Another early brick maker was Nicholas Oakes, who established his business in the mid-1850s between Court Street and the area of Longfellow Elementary School. His 1850s home on Court Street still stands. Most of us know it as the former Grant Wood home. And these men and other brick makers in Iowa City made building bricks, not paving bricks, that were used for road surfaces. So I'll begin my discussion on, on the 10 block of South Clinton Street with Iowa Book and Supply on the north corner of the block. We all know about that place. According to Irving Weber, Theodore Sanxe, that's spelled S-A-N-X-A-Y, a descendant of French Huguenots, arrived in Iowa City in 1840 or 1841, and in partnership with Malcolm Murray, established the first mercantile house in the city at the site of today's Iowa Book and Supply. This was believed to be the first brick building in Iowa City, and it was constructed with bricks from Sylvanus Johnson's brickyard. The Iowa City Standard newspaper was also established in this building. Now you know the Sanxay name also from the structure on Market Street next to Gloria Day, perhaps, which some think or many believe to be the oldest extant original house in Iowa City. I say original because we think there's one that's a little older near Manville Heights. But Sanxay's mercantile building and many other structures located near the corner were destroyed by fire in 1867. And shortly after that, a large building was erected. The post office evidently was located there initially along with other businesses. Sanxay dissolved his partnership with Murray and moved his business to the, the far south corner of the 10 block where you all know about, if you've been here a long time, Whetstone Drugs existed. Now, Peter Day, D-E-Y, one source said it was pronounced die, but I'm going to use day for not knowing for sure. Peter Day bought the building. This is the one that's down where Whetstone was. No, I'm sorry. I'm back to the, to the building that was here. In fact, it's this building right here now that preceded Iowa Book and Supply. Peter Day bought it remodeled it into the St. James Hotel in 1872. I don't know if that name is familiar to any of you from reading history, but it was considered to be the finest hotel in Iowa City between 1872 and 1914 for quite some time. This is an image, we think, from the 1880s. Peter Day was a very significant figure in Iowa City history and in Iowa. He was trained as a civil engineer who came from the east where he worked on projects in New York and Pennsylvania. And he moved to Illinois where he was in charge of division work with the Chicago and Rock Island Railroad. Came to Iowa City in 1853 and was a division engineer for the construction 
of the Mississippi and Missouri Railroad. That was the railroad that first reached Iowa City at the very end of 1855. He made surveys for the railroad running from Davenport to Council Bluffs via Iowa City and Des Moines. And then he later worked with the Union Pacific Railroad on its line from the Missouri River to the Salt Lake Basin during the construction of the first transcontinental railroad. Peter Day refused to be a part of the illicit scheme of the capitalists who set up a crooked company called Credit Mobilier. The company was handling railroad contracts and was greatly overinflating the costs to make illicit profits and then bribed congressmen to pass legislation in favor of the Union Pacific Railroad. The fraud was evidently conducted from 1864, while Lincoln was still president, to 1867, but wasn't brought to public attention until 1872, which would have been during the Grant administration. As a result of that, Day resigned as the chief engineer for the Pacific Railroad when he was approached by the fraudulent enterprise to participate. And in Iowa City, Day was a mayor uh, in fact, shortly after he came to Iowa City, which was unusual, and also president of the First National Bank. And he was one of three commissioners who oversaw the construction of the state capitol building in Des Moines. You may be familiar with the Day House, or Day Home, on North Clinton Street, built in 1857. Kind of belies its age. He lived there until his death in 1911, and if I read correctly, his two sons and their wives lived in the house together as a foursome for all of their lives. In 1997, the Day House became the home of the Writer's Workshop Program. Now let's return to a discussion of the St. James Hotel with a look at this undated image. Late 1800s, early 1900s, I'd say. Note the presence of University Bookstore. I think you can make it out there on the bottom, on the first floor. Also present is a Fink Cigar Store. After the Jefferson Hotel opened in 1913, the St. James Hotel was no longer the finest hotel in Iowa City. In 1914, the University of Iowa leased the building and it became the Iowa Union and a dormitory. We see the lettering on two sides of the mansard roof. Here is the storefront which housed a tobacco shop and a bookstore. Look at the huge plate glass windows. Another view offers us a look at the back of the so-called cigar store Indian circled in red. What do you say, very un politically incorrect, right? The, such large wooden carved figures, I understand, were used to advertise a tobacco shop, much like barber poles were used to advertise barber shops. I read where their use may have originated from earlier days when there was general illiteracy in the populace, and Native Americans were depicted because they introduced tobacco to European settlers in early America. So the St. James Hotel was turned over to the university for use as a dormitory and a student union, providing the functions of being a student social center and a rooming house, predecessor of our memorial union in 1925. A devastating fire broke out in 1916 and the building was destroyed. Photographer Fred Kent, you know that name, was a rumor then but he had gone home to DeWitt for the Easter break. A number of others were in the building at the time of the fire. However, all got out safely. This image shows the complete destruction. Members of the Day family decided to rebuild the building of today known as the Day Building was constructed in 1917. It was built to allow for expansion up to six stories with a future hotel in mind. The University Bookstore was the first business to sign a lease and it was in the corner part of the building, right where Iowa Book is. It was to remain there for 53 years. Here is Williams Iowa Supply Company. 
that was established in the other end, the south end of that building, which would be where Baskin and Robbins is now, if you've seen that of late. And this came in in 1922 or earlier. Here's a later picture of Iowa Supply Company. And now you'll have to help me. Is it Vanderhoof or Vanderhoof? Vanderhoof. Hoff, neither one. In 1944, Ray Vanderhoof bought the store from Hugh Williams, and in 1957, Iowa Supply Company became Iowa Book and Supply, according to my research. In 1965, Vanderhoof acquired the location of Fro Wines, which was between Iowa Book and Supply and the University Bookstore, which still occupied the north corner of the building. In 1970, Vanderhoff acquired the University Bookstore and its corner location, bringing Iowa Book to its current size. So here's how Iowa Book and Supply got to its present size. Started with the south portion there and renamed Iowa Book and Supply in 1957. Fro Wine was located, and they've been in other places, as you know, in town. Acquired by Iowa Book in 1965, and then University Bookstore sold out to Iowa Book in 1970. So that all became Iowa Book and Supply. Now a side story. If you were here back in the 70s, you'd remember this very well. On May 5th of 1971, about 350 students began a peaceful protest marching from the Pentecrest to the courthouse to the National Guard Armory. There were demonstrations in opposition to the Vietnam War and the Kent State killings, which had occurred one year before, almost to the day. Here we see student monitors, as they called them, who volunteered to help protect the windows of Iowa Book and Supply. But they were overwhelmed and rocks were thrown, resulting in eight broken windows. Windows were shattered at at least two other places, things, things, and things, and the post office on South Lynn Street. A total of about 155 windows were broken, and at least 26 persons were arrested. After I moved to Iowa City in 1979, one of my colleagues said, well, he explained why the windows in Iowa Book and Supply were so small. But larger windows have been put back in place. Not, I don't remember when that happened, when they got big again. Okay, so here's today's view of the day building. No, I have to go back one. I don't have the slide. Well, let's hope that I do have the rest of them here. But anyway, it's interesting to note that one or more bookstores have occupied space at the Clinton Iowa Avenue corner continuously for 150 years. So here we get to the summit. Molly's Cupcakes, 10 and 14 South are their addresses. Abutting the day building to the south is the building occupied by the Summit and Molly's Cupcakes. As Irving Weber might have said, how is your building IQ concerning this one? This building was constructed, we think, in 1890 or 92, when William Preston Coast began his business here. Any of you remember the Coast name? operating as a men's clothing store. The Coast store remained for 43 years until it went out of business in about 1932. You would have had to have read about it. And Coast's slogan was, from coast to coast, no better clothes than Coast's. William Coast was an important figure in early Iowa City history. Among other things, he served on the building committee for the 1903 Carnegie Library built on Lynn Street. Well, Coast only occupied the north two-thirds of the building, and the south portion was occupied by barber shops for many years. Anybody remember a barber shop there? You do? Okay. I'll discuss that in a moment. After 1932, Coast Space was occupied by Brennan's, Bagwell's, and Towner's, all clothing shops. You, you may remember Seifert's women's apparel that was here between 1962 and 1984. Seifert's was a chain of 60 stores headquartered in Ottumwa, Iowa. After Seifert's was here 15 years, in 1977, they remodeled at a cost of $350,000. Also, Land's End was here, do you remember that? Between 1990 and 1999. How many remember the Peaceful Fool? 
It was a store with an eccentric mix of clothing, housewares, books, and accessories. It was only there for the two years of 1999 to 2001. The summit opened in late 2001, so they've had a, about a 20-year run. It was named for the gatherings of the Rat Pack, you know, the group of Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and others. The partners who operated the summit, or opened the summit said they spent $850,000 to bring it up to code and restore the original structure in brick. Seems like an awful lot of money. I remember eating here a number of times and enjoying a brewski or two while listening to the Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra songs, a refreshing escape from loud rock music so often heard in establishments. Molly's Cupcakes opened at 14 South Clinton in 2012, so they're pretty well established. Now, Allen's Barbershop, does that name ring a bell? Was located here from 1953 to 1972. And barbershops were here back to 1890 when it was constructed, when it first housed Coe's Men's Store. In fact, records indicate that a barbershop called Whitaker's was on the site as far back as 1867. And A.M. Winter's barbershop was there from 1920 to 1953, and he turned it over to a Forrest Allen, who was a longtime Winter's employee. In 1953, giant elm trees obscured the view of Schaefer Hall from the barbershop, not having yet succumbed to Dutch elm disease. Now only one giant elm remains on the Pentecrest. Allen's Barbershop closed in 1972 after almost 20 years under that name. And between 1972 and the opening of Molly's, a number of businesses were there. Do you remember Kinko's Copies? They were there for 15 years. The next building on our tour, just to the south of, of Summit and Molly's, holds some fascination. It's the smaller building on the right that has the please call on them. What was there? Do you remember? Roses? Was that the optical cover? Yes. Right. I'm returning now to the 1854 daguerreotype that I showed you of Weatherby's. Bob Hibbs believed that the tallest building on the right of the picture to be this present day one south of Molly's Cupcakes, right there. It doesn't look quite the same, does it? But if we look at it from the sides, which we can't see here, we can see the, the tapered roof portions where it goes up and across and down again. And it looks, it, it had some kind of a refacing, obviously, at the top of the building. Well, what makes it interesting is that Bob Hibbs wrote, it could possibly be the oldest surviving structure in downtown Iowa City. The early occupants included several confectionaries and Eugene Namer's Bakery, which operated from the late 1880s to about 1910, famous for its very popular snowflake bread. Burner's Drugstore was here for two different periods. Here's an image of Burner's while they were there. After Berners Pharmacy vacated the building, Alfred McDonald established McDonald Optical there in 1956, where his business, later run by family members, remained until very recently. Anybody remember when they went out of there? I couldn't find a date, but it wasn't that long ago. So they were there for a long time. And you remember John, the, the mayor of Iowa City, who remained in the business too. The next building to the south, seen here on the right, appears to the unknowing eye to be a modern structure, doesn't it? Not so, probably dates to the 1880s. On this slide, the double pointed arrow shows the building in 1912, and today after it underwent a dramatic facelift in the 1970s. The current facade is comprised of aggregate and the window replacements clearly do not mimic the originals. The, this building now occupied by Shorts, Burger, and Shine, anybody familiar with that place? 
Clinton Street Social Club and Nail Studio was occupied for 50 years by Shorts Shoe Repair and Shine. So now we have Shorts Burger and Shine. We had Shirts, Shorts Shoe Repair and Shine. Kenneth Bell was the owner and operated the shop with his father and brother, Lawrence Short. From 1920 to 1970, when Shorts announced they were going out of business. Shorts shop sign can be seen circled in red at the far left of this 1941 image. So Shorts Burger and Shine was established in 2008. Why the name? One of its partners, former Hawkeye and San Diego Charger kicker Nate Kading, also a partner in downtown businesses Tailgate and Pullman's, said he and his partners wanted to perpetuate the name of the shoe business that had such a long run there. A shoe shine chair was even donated and set in place in the restaurant. I haven't been in it, I guess it's here. Thus evolved the name Shorts Burger and Shine. Another establishment that you may remember, One-Eyed Jake's, maybe not, I don't know if you were going into the bar above the store, occupied the top two floors of 18 through 20 South Clinton for 20 years. Other re recent occupants have included Baldies and Melios. Now we get to the next building that houses what has become kind of a downtown icon on the far right here. The airliner is housed in the building that also got a facelift in 1950, comprised of buff Roman brick. Along the edge of the building, it had become obscure. I don't have a date for the new facade. In this image, the double arrow compares the front of the building to today to 1912. Quite a difference. The story of the airliner begins with the discussion of the Ranella family. Is that name familiar to anybody? They had grocery stores in a couple, at least a couple places. Joseph Ranella and his family came to Iowa City in 1892 from Sicily. They established a grocery on this corner of the land now, that of Hubbard Park. This is Hubbard Park we're looking at, gazing toward the northwest a bit. You know, Hubbard Park is just west of the Pentecrest on Madison Street. Later, a family member ran a grocery store and housed, that was housed in a building on Bowery Street, the little Quonset building that's had tons of different groceries over the years. Fruit and vegetable sales were a big part of the Ranella's grocery enterprises. Not long after this picture was taken, all the buildings on this block were removed as a women's athletic field was developed by the university. And now, of course, Hubbard Park. After vacating their corner store and their home next to it, that is the Ranella's, they bought the building that now houses the airliner in 1922. And they lived upstairs while running the grocery business downstairs. And before they bought the building, T.W. Townsend operated the Townsend Photo Studio there using both floors. He began his photography business in Iowa City in 1874. And the studio reopened at 25 East Washington Street, which was just south of the Pentecrest. Timothy Townsend was noted for producing the series of stereoscopic images called Views of Iowa City and Vicinity. These images were created in the late 1860s and the 1870s. I got a kick out of an advertisement for Townsend's in the Iowa City Citizen in 1908, 1908 which read, quote, it is announced that all old people over 65 years of age visiting the gallery will be posed and given a free picture. In 1944, the Ranellas changed the first floor into a tavern, steakhouse, and Italian restaurant, which they named the Airliner. So that goes back to 1844. I think it might even say so on the outside. The name was taken from a diner that some family members frequented near Midway Airport in Chicago. And prior to the Ranellas' acquisition of the building, Racine's ran one of their stores out of it. Racine's was a cigar, cigarette, and billiards business, along with the fountain. At one time, there were four Racine stores in downtown Iowa City, all at the same time. One of them operated out of the Jefferson Hotel. Fred Racine was in business for 43 years. I say I inserted some slides here and didn't get them numbered and sequenced. Here's one of the stereoscopic images. 
The building next to the airliner has not received a facelift where the Cortado is there. Unlike the two north of it that I just discussed, the wider building on the right contains part of the airliner and also houses OPN Architects and Cortado Coffee and Cafe, which opened in 2017. I believe that at one time Racines occupied both structures seen here, the whole thing, as seen in this 1940s image between the red lines. They must have had quite a business. Do any of you go back far enough to remember the Uptowner on, at 24 South Clinton? It opened in 1948. They advertised themselves as Iowa City's newest and finest restaurant, proudly presenting the modern dining place that Iowa Cityans have long needed. I found no reference to it in 1950, so it may have gone out of business in just a couple of years. Kenny's Tavern was at 24 South Clinton in 1950, and I don't think it lasted very long. Redwood and Ross's men's clothing store was at 26 South Clinton from about 1958 to 1970. There were, they were in many other Big Ten university towns. You remember Redwood and Ross's? Yeah. Okay, good. Now the three remaining buildings on the block have the addresses of 28, 30, and 32 South Clinton. When we compare a 1912 image with the one from today, we can see that the leftmost building of the three has had a facelift. The 1912 image shows that there are really only two buildings. Now it looks as if three, doesn't it? Just the south half of the wide building was refaced. The north half. Isn't that what I mean? That'd be the north half. The wide structure is of uncertain build date, but it could date to 1857. I am a little suspicious of that, though. I don't know. In about 1870, Moses Bloom, his name was, first name was Moses Bloom, establishes Bloom's One Price Clothing House here. It was a men's store that was in business for a long time. Frowine's office supply had its beginning in Iowa City in 1917. It was founded by a man named Jimmy Burns, if that name's familiar to anybody, and was first located at 28 South Clinton Street in the building now occupied by Ewers. It may have been called the Iowa Typewriter Company. Iowa Typewriter, get this, sold fountain pens and sold and repaired typewriters and also restrung tennis rackets. <laughs> That's an interesting combination. When the Day Building opened, Jimmy Burns moved there to become one of its first occupants. And in the early 1920s, George Frowine went into partnership with Burns. Later, the business was called Frowine and Burns. In 1966, the store was moved to the Paul Helen Building to greatly expand its space. You remember it there, perhaps. In 1987, with a total of three stores, Fro Wines was listed as, quote, this area's largest office furniture and supply dealer. And in the early 1920s, Arthur Ewers, so it's, that was the last name, it's not an apostrophe, bought the entire building comprising 28 and 30 South Clinton, sometime later refaced this north half with new glazed brick, a modern Chicago window grouping, they called it, a new terracotta cornice, and plate glass shop windows. Quite a makeover. Ewers Men's Store remains in the north half of the building, of course, to this day. The south half of the building is now occupied by Tailgate, a Hawkeye apparel shop that opened in 2014. The shop also specializes in items with a vintage flair, such as T-shirts paying tribute to local landmarks like Prairie Lights, John's Grocery, and Polly Ice Pizza. The following year, it was purchased by American Eagle Outfitters, which planned to open as many as 200 stores in college towns. Lettering on the outside of the building declares it to be the Grossix building, G-R-O-S-S-I-X. I have found no explanation for that attribution. However, the building is owned by Avera Gross, G-R-O-S-S. It seems like it kind of ties in. In 2014, Vera Gross, renovated 
the second and third floors of this building that we see here to include two high-end apartments. In 2015, the asking price was between $2,500 and $2,800 per month. I'll mention two known occupants of the first floor prior to tailgate. From 1912 to 1954, it was owned and occupied by the Rees family. R-I-E-S, would that be Rees or Rees? We'll call it the Rees family and operated as the Rees Iowa Bookstore. That's a run of about 42 years, but in addition, the Rees presence in the book business elsewhere in town dated to the 1880s. Now, some of you surely remember Guild Imports, right? Good. Operated at 30 South Clinton from 1984 to 2010, but was first on Iowa Avenue in 1970. I believe Gilda may be a resident here. Is that correct? She's not here by chance. That would be great if she would be. I have a little story that she'll like to recount. Her unique shop contained items that owner Gilda Six, S-I-X, selected during yearly trips through Scandinavia. Over the years, imports, Gilda Imports received a lot of publicity, found a lot of Iowa City Press Citizen articles with pictures and stories. And I have one, I think, very touching tale offered by former Dean of the College of Law, William Hines. John Paul Stevens, you remember an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, was strolling around downtown Iowa City with his wife in 1983 when he was here for a College of Law program. The couple saw a pair of candlesticks in the window of Gilda's shop, identical to some they lost when they moved to Washington. They wanted them but did not have their credit card, checkbook, or enough cash. Gilda didn't know who they were. She said, that's okay, and sent them on their way with the goods, telling them that they could simply send her a check when they returned to their home. Several days later, Gilda received their check with a handwritten note thanking her for their willingness to trust complete strangers with a rather expensive purchase. When Stevens returned to Iowa City to present a lecture in 1999, that was, what, 16 years later, he asked Dean Hines to be sure to invite Gilda Six to all of the lecture events. Quote, she was thrilled with the invitation and attended all of the activities dressed to the nines as only she could dress. <laughs> Stevens went out of his way to talk to her, introduce her to others, and pose for photographs with her. Gilda Imports closed its doors in December 2010 after 26 years at 30 South Clinton Street and 40 total years in Iowa City. And now we get to the South Building, that which houses Poncheros. How many of you have eaten at a Poncheros? There are quite a few now, aren't there? What do we have? Three or four of them? One in Coralville, two in Iowa City, one in North Liberty, I believe. Here's another view of the building. Poncheros has been described as a fast, casual Tex-Mex restaurant serving Mexican-style cuisine. Did you know that Poncheros is a franchise operation? More importantly, the store I just showed you was the first Ponchero store ever. It was opened in August of 1992 by a LaGrange, Illinois native, Rodney Anderson. I don't think he had any previous connection to Iowa City. Wikipedia relates that just after Anderson received an MBA degree from the University of Chicago, he opened his first Poncheros with capital made from the stock market. Three years later, Anderson, shown here on the left, was ready to franchise and launched his expansion into what has become over 60 stores throughout the country. Poncheros has also been on Riverside Drive since April of 2000. They now have stores in Coralville and North Liberty. Well, the building that Poncheros occupies at 32 South Clinton certainly existed before Poncheros came in. As I discuss the history of the building, I want to mention a very significant structure that was on the lot where the eastern portion of the Poncheros brick building sits. Here's an aerial view via Google Maps 
showing the entire block that I've been discussing. You see Poncheros in the bottom left. When the state legislature convened in Iowa City in December 1841, two years after we were founded, with Iowa City as a new capital, the old capital was not yet ready for the legislature to meet in it. So a man named Walter Butler hastily constructed a wooden frame structure that came to be known as Butler's Capital or Butler's State House using his own funds. I think he later got some compensation from the territory. And that's where it sat, we think, on the lot where that building is and probably the eastern portion of the building. Might have set back a little farther to the north. Here's a picture of Butler's Capital sometime after it was moved, which happened in 1856, to Dubuque Street south of College, and then it was demolished in 1892. Well, you remember I mentioned the Sanxe family. Members of the Sanxe family built the Poncheros building in two phases. We think between 1868 and 1874, but the dates are uncertain. I've read of different dates. It could go back before that to 1856 or 1850. Sanxe's hardware and iron store was the first occupant, although it looks quite a bit different there. Bob Hibbs indicated that the corner building was erected in 1850 and assuming it wasn't torn down, that's it today, and the attached building to the east in 1856. The longest occupant of the building was the Whetstone Drug Store, and certainly you remember that if you've been here for any period of time. It opened there in 1874. The founder was John Whetstone. Later, the store was operated by son Robert. Whetstones occupied this corner until 1974, which was a span of 100 years, which is quite remarkable. The building itself was owned by the Sanxe family until 1893 when it was sold to Peter Day, the one I mentioned earlier who had the Day building where Iowa Book is. And it stayed in the Day family until 1948. I don't know what after that. I'll show you many views of whetstones over the years. What, do you have a minute? Sure. Okay. And Bill was a, was a pharmacist, and they owned that building until Poncheros, until Rodney Anderson bought that building from them. Okay. And, uh, did, did they, were they descendants of LeGrand Byington that goes way back in Iowa City history, I wonder? Yes, they were. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. And Eleanor Sierra. The other, the other thing that was going to oh, happen okay. upstairs in that building was, was a, 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 a store called Bivouac, which was a ski. Ah, uh, okay. And, and then, well. and then uh, Poncheros, when they came to town, I happened to be the architect on the job. Ah, uh, okay. And I went to talk to Bill and Helen, and I said, I think this guy's got something going for him. And I said, you might want to be serious about it. And I think they eventually sold, sold the building to him. Oh, okay. Well, that's neat. So the so the Poncheros folks may own that building now. I think so. Wow, that's good. Bill Byington was my classmate in the College of Pharmacy when before I went into medicine. Ah. And so I knew Bill and Helen very well. Well, we moved mm. here to Oak Hall. We live in Helen Byington's apartment. Hmm. Interesting. Well, thanks. That's great. You see the awnings here, they were used extensively with businesses along Clinton Street in those days. I have pictures where there are almost awnings on every, every one of the buildings. Whetstone's motto was, quote, store of conveniences at the convenient corner. It was quite the hangout for university students, especially before the Memorial Union was built, which was 1925. And as Hibbs described, checks could be cashed and postcards purchased and mailed to mom and dad to request more money. 
Time could be spent over a cherry Coke or a triple thick chocolate shake at the soda fountain. And what was the feature of the fountain? Do you remember what they called it? Persian sherbet. Whetstones ran this ad in a 1973 edition of the Press Citizen. I'll read some of the text on it. The message was Chautauqua, five cent cigars, drugstore soda fountain, Persian sherbet, high wheeled bicycles, hoop skirts. A lot of things have changed over the years, but the quality and service are still the same at Whetstones. This was the year before they, they went out of business. Finally, the end came in May of 1974. Whetstones, originally established by John Whetstone, would have begun its 101st year on June 1st. So, in conclusion, all the buildings in the 10 block south, 10 blocks south, we'll call it, yes, of Clinton Street, are over 100 years old, with the most recent one built 104 years ago, the Day Building. In 1966, the city contracted for a large-scale appraisal of buildings in the downtown area, you know, for what? In anticipation that some of them would be acquired to fall victim to the planned urban renewal project for Iowa City. Most of the buildings in the 10 block south were appraised, or planned to be appraised. There must have been put a scare into some people. But when urban renewal swallowed up a lot of old buildings, in downtown Iowa City, not one of those in the 10 block was lost. So this block is one of the truly stretches of historical buildings in the downtown area. And finally, being a key focal point next to the old Capitol property, this two block stretch of Clinton Street was the first in Iowa City to receive brick paving. And that was in 1895. So it included this block as well as the one that went up to Jefferson there. Here's a view of when the paving job was being done there. Notice the trees, of course, that are long gone, probably elms. The steamroller up in near the top, the limestone curb, which is uh, just along that yellow arrow just behind it and the massive numbers of bricks that were piled up there. I don't know what this was, uh, some kind of an alarm box or mailbox maybe? Right here? It looks like a mailbox. Yeah, it kind of does, doesn't it? Well, thank you. <laughs> what, any other comments you have of stories or any remembrances of places along the way? Well, the, the people that owned uh, Iowa Book, Vanderhoffs, have just moved into Oak Knoll East. So when you go over oh, there, okay. you might be in your audience. Okay. I so knew. I don't know whether you'll do this same program over there. But no, no, because. We're not doing them because of residents being able to watch simultaneously, so it's a, it'll be a different program. There's, I knew Kay Mesher, who was a sister of, of Vanderhoff, maybe, maybe Ray's wife, I'm not sure. Kay, if she's still with us, would be in her 80s, so I don't know. Ray passed away some time ago. Restaurants except that one. Uh, um, that's right, there wasn't much in the way of restaurants there. You mean other than the summit right now? Yeah. Um, well, but there were those kind of coffee type shop type restaurants, but uh, yeah, right. Just uh, given, I guess that's right. It's a neat block, it's it didn't succumb to the wreckers ball like so many places. Have you ever driven in the back there? I, I took a ride down the little alleyway. It's just a one lane passage and it gets you in behind the buildings. They, they can park there for the places that are on Dubuque Street too. So it covers all, all the streets around. Yes? I came here in 19... 
67 to teach the university. Someone else came that year. I did not know him, but he told me the story later. This is not a big town. You can make a U-turn in the middle of the block on the plane. He oh. did, and he got his ticket. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. I'm working on a project now to study the Irish family. Captain Irish, does that name ring a bell? Yeah. And why he was named Captain and his descendants, his notable children who had pretty illustrious careers, at least four of them, and so I'm trying to work up a talk on that. Do you know of a place called Rose Hill? That was his residence and property out at the east end of Davenport. And part of that property went into Hickory Hill Park in, I think, 1966 when the park was established. Your early map had a park really close to Capitol Square. Oh, yes. That yes. didn't last long, obviously. Yeah, I should know more about that, but I'm it's, I'm not quite sure what to say about that. And Let's. Then Governor's Park is the same as College uh, Hill Park, right? Um, I don't remember that being called. Do you mean College Green? College Green, yeah. Uh, was it labeled as such here? Let's see what I've it got. Was on your. Uh, there, let's get this a little bigger here. See, there it is, Capitol Square. And Did it come up? Is, is it came up on one screen, okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yes, where it says park there, right. What, let's, I'm trying to think here. What is there now? Where are we talking, Jefferson Street? And oh, it's University. Well, that's developed. Yeah. And, Oh, sure, that's where, let's see, where's Lynn Street? Right, that's where the University Hospital was in 1898. That was built in 1898, that was right here. And then the old mechanics building, yeah. Academy was over here, somewhere in here. East Hall? And this would be Stewart Hall, right here. And they just tore all that old stuff out, didn't they, in the last six, five, six months. I don't know, anybody heard what they're planning for that area? I imagine they're up to something. You know, the old Sanxe house that's by the Gloria, Gloria Day, is that what I want to say, church? Is that the one that's on Market and Dubuque? Yes. The Sanxe house, which is just to the west, West of that, there's an empty lot. Seems to me there was something there that went down not that long ago. It's all nice and green and grass. I imagine the university wants to put a large structure of some kind in there, because they've agreed to move the Sanxe house like across the street, which could cost upward of a million dollars, which seems very stupid to me, <laughs> to, to have to do something like that. But that's what they're planning on doing, I guess. Have you read a lot of Irving Weber's books? Yeah, I have them all and I consult them a lot. A lot of yeah. Interesting things in there. Yeah, there are. And I think there are quite a few things that didn't get into those books that were in the newspapers. Yeah. If you go to the public library, when you can next get in, they have a, they're rather oversized books that have those newspaper articles in them. Eighteen thirty nine. The Summit Street was actually the eastern edge of town. Yes. It, it, these I think are what they called outblocks with these these other numbers that are also there. And Summit would be right here. And of course that obelisk is at the corner of Summit and Court that delineated the southeast corner of the town at that time.
Yeah, also, you, you notice, of course, where it says churches up there on Church Street. So they evidently envisioned churches there, probably hence the name, and nothing ever developed there. Now, North Market is still there, isn't it? Yeah. There was an old ward school there at one time, before we got the new schools in 1917, which were Saban and Longfellow and, what's the other one? North Dodge. And there was a Kellogg school. There were four schools. Horse Man? Uh, no. Yeah, Horse Man. Horse Man. Right, right. Yeah. Yep. And they, they called this Governor Square down here. No. College Green is where it's marked. Oh, yeah. There we go. You're right. That's, that's the only that's, one that's that's correct, is, isn't it? is still a part. <laughs> right, right. Well, here. Salt market. There, there's nothing there of this sort, is there? And look at this Dillon's Island here that's no longer here in the river. I don't know what happened. Up, up above here it says quarry, I think, up in the top there. I think they got some of the stone for old capital there, but it was considered of a lesser quality, and they got more of it up north, kind of off the Mahaffey Bridge Road area. There's a quarry up that way, I think. Yes. So squiggly lines in the lower uh, right mm -hmm. corner. Ralston Creek. Ralston Creek. Creek. Yes. So was that map maybe drawn other than in New Iowa City when when they platted it? I don't know. I mean, because it just seems odd that they would put all these nice. Well, yeah, look at how it's running through these lots. Well, they changed the course. Didn't pay much attention to that. They did, they did change the course in Ralston Creek in the Longfellow area back about 1910 to, to have it run down where there was to be an alley. And it was running on Rundle Street. It bowed out in the Rundle, or Rundell if you prefer. And, you know, Rundle is as wide as it is because the streetcar ran down the middle. Interesting stuff, I think. <laughs> Thanks, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Kathy, it's nice you come to visit too. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. <laughs>